a red herring. A herring is begun to rot. Or... Huh. Um, one so one we, Russian uh, waters. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Today is April first, twenty twenty. The time is ten fifteen a.m. and we're resuming our walkthrough of H seven one five and that's related to the clean heat standard, which we had started previously and run out of time. And that we have through eleven o'clock for this, at which point. Uh, we'll return to solid waste and hear from Matt Chapman, the director of the uh, solid waste division at the Department of Environmental Conservation. So with that, Ms. Schakowsky, thanks for coming back. And we'd love to pick back up where we left off on 715. Uh, yes. 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 Good morning. Ellen Schakowsky, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, we left off with the overview of uh, H715 um, on page seven. And to remind you, um, the details on this bill are important, but the, the high level walkthrough involves the fact that um, this bill directs the PUC to adopt and administer a clean heat standard. Um, they are going to, it, there are elements of it that are reminiscent of the renewable energy standard. They're going to uh, dictate the amount of emission reductions that um, obligated parties under this bill are required to make every year uh, based on the percentage of heating fuel they sell into Vermont, into and in Vermont. Uh, and so the obligated parties are those who make the first point of sale of heating fuel in Vermont. Uh, so we left off last, uh, last on page seven, if you're following along, uh, I, I discussed the early action credits. The other main component of this bill is that emissions, greenhouse gas emissions will be measured um, by, uh, they will be sort of represented by clean heat credits. Uh, and the, the subsection C on page seven states that action starting that actions that have been taken in uh, starting in 2022 that uh, cause emission reduction can earn clean heat credits. So actions now can be creditable and then used in the future. All right, so starting with subsection D on page seven, equitable distribution of clean heat measures. The clean heat standard shall be designed and implemented to enhance social equity by minimizing adverse impact to low income and moderate income customers and those households with the highest energy burdens. The design shall ensure all customers have an equitable opportunity to participate in and benefit from clean heat measures regarded, regardless of heating fuel used, income level, geographic location, or home ownership. A substantial portion of clean heat credit retired by each obligated party shall be sourced from clean heat measures delivered to low income and moderate income customers. The portion of each obligated party's required amount needed to satisfy the annual clean heat requirement shall be at least 16% from low income customers and 16% from moderate income customers. So I'm now on page eight. The definition of low income customer and moderate income customer shall be set by the commission in consultation with equity stakeholders and in alignment with other existing definitions. The commission may consider front loading the credit requirements for low income and moderate income customers so that the greatest proportion of clean heat measures reach low income and moderate income Vermonters in the earlier years. In order to best serve low income and moderate income customers, the commission shall have authority to change these portions and the criteria used to define low income and moderate income customers for good cause after notice and opportunity for public process. The clean heat measures delivered to a customer qualifying for government sponsored low income energy subsidy shall qualify for clean heat credits required by subdivision two of this section. All right, so there's a lot of information there. Um, the, as we've talked about, the PUC is going to require each obligated party every year to, to retire a certain number of clean heat credits 
This section is requiring further that of that requirement, 16% of the credits shall come from low income customers and 16% from moderate income customers. That will happen because um, there will be either um, a change in the fuel mix sold to lower income moderate customers, or there will be work done, either weatherization or installation of cold climate heat pumps, advanced wood heat. Um, the work done, there'll have to be a demonstration that at least 16% and 16%, so 32% each year comes from low and moderate income customers. Given that the program is voluntary, what, what I'm just thinking, well, how do you, I understand the target, why that would be desirable. How do you, does the bill address trying to make sure that that actually happens? So the primary incentive, and it's coming up in a couple of pages, is that it's part of the, um, it's part of the obligation that is on the obligated party. And so there is an enforcement mechanism on that. If they don't uh, if an obligated party is unable to demonstrate that they have done work for low and income moderate customers, low and moderate income customers, um, there will be enforcement. There's option for enforcement against them. So there is an incentive here for those fuel dealers and the, the providers doing the work. There's an incentive for them to do this because it is a specific requirement each year. And the so, Mr. Chair, I'm we say devil is in the details, but could, I couldn't pass a test right now on what the clean heat standard is and how it works. Um, even though it, it's been told to me, it's not part of my, yeah, my, my reasoning and basis for examination. Um, without all this low and high income, which I would call the culture war section, of this bill, which is has to be resolved. But uh, do we all know what what it is that we're or that these paragraphs are arguing over? Um, who gets what? Do we know what the darn thing does? What and the, what the what is? Yeah, yeah, yeah what they're um, and how that's calculated and um, and what standard we're going to use. Um, we're certainly going to be into. You know, there are a bunch of freeloaders, or there are a bunch of wealthy people, or there are a bunch of this, that, and the other thing who are game in this system. But what's the system that we're the spoils that we're dividing up? I don't understand what the spoils are before sure. we're dividing so them up. I'd like to take a stab at it and then have council actually tell us what it means. But <laughs> learning by testing. Uh, so if you sell a fossil fuel, you based on the volume of that fuel, just leave it at that, carbon intensity becomes part of the math too, but based on your selling fossil fuel, the amount of it, you'll have an obligation established to uh, basically sort of offset it with a certain number of clean heat credits, clean heat credits coming from delivering clean heat measures, such as weatherization or installing a cold climate heat pump. And so the fuel dealers will end up with obligated fuel dealers. The obligated part, I'll just say fuel dealers, obligated parties end up with obligations. They need to gain a certain number of credits to meet the obligation. And the work on the ground that we're talking about in this section is how you earn the credits. Is that on track, Ms. Scott? Um, yes. There are a couple of small details in there, but um, I also think it's helpful to think of it like the renewable energy standard, where you the state has obligated utilities to increase the amount of renewable energy they are they are putting in the system every year. This is having the PUC um, require the obligated parties here, who are fuel suppliers, either at the wholesale level or whoever is the first to make the sale of heating fuel into the state. They're required to um, annually have a percentage of um, that fuel based on their carbon emissions reduced every year. And so they can either do that by changing their fuel or doing something that would reduce emissions like weatherization. And that is that is based on a credit system. That's a gradual changing of the rules of the game, is it not? I guess. 
What, which okay. name? Well, each year something becomes different or more, yes, there more prescriptive or more, or funnels pushes, yes. uh, arm twists folks into behaving gradually. Yes. Moving. Yes. Can, it would seem to me the power companies when they're doing that are, are purchasing their power and they're and they're cleaning up by purchasing power from, but there's a choice in the field of this. For the fuel dealer, what if their customers don't participate? What if you have someone that has an um, oil heat furnace and they, like it. They, they, like it. they just like it and they don't want it. They, well, they don't, don't have the money to change. Right? Isn't there no, a, that's, or, that's, or that's, that's another that's, 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 a, that's, a different, that's a different issue. Yeah. You know, equally valid, but, but yeah, yeah, you know, um they might do a whole bunch of stuff to get somebody interested in changing, but what if they don't? Right. So in the absence of participation, doesn't the reward come become bigger for those people who do participate? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> someone has the money's yeah. available. It just would change the price or the reward or the or the economic punishment. You know, is that the, is that the thing that, that, yeah. that drives it? Yeah, I. So, Bill, I want to hear from so that yeah. is right. So that that is actually another distinction between this and the RES. Yeah. There, the RES directs utilities to work directly with their customers. This, however, clean heat credits can be purchased from anyone. Uh, a, a fuel supplier can purchase them from anyone who's done the work, uh, including and especially there will be contractors who do weatherization projects. There will be um, uh, suppliers who sell the, these uh, advanced flood heating systems. So these will be outside entities in addition to customers, but who will be generating credits who they can then purchase from. In addition, there's a- Can I ask a question on that? Yeah. Can you buy them from, your, from the customer? It depends, and it's not entirely clear, but you are not, there is not a, because I, one of the questions I raised in the house was, are fuel dealers going to end up sort of um, going after other fuel dealers' right. customers? That is technically an option under this, because a customer is not found if that, if they have credits to sell them to their current, their current person, yeah. right, right. And isn't there also a state designated agent yes. to deliver services to like if you yes. have last recourse. So there's a last resort option where there will be a designated entity by the state who will be doing this work and generating credits. And so um, the last resort is that if someone can't find credits, they'll be able to purchase credits from the default agent. Why do they want to purchase? Does someone want to purchase credits? We're making the, we are establishing this market um, with because of the incentive of the requirement to comply with this law. This is an artificial, we are creating the value by having this, this requirement on fuel suppliers. So is in, the, is in the system, is there someone who goes, there's something that's really going on here now, maybe I could buy up some credits now because they're cheap and then sell them later? I think currently, yes, that is an option that's available. That's an option that is available. It's not specifically prohibited. So my sort of, again, back to on the ground, my fuel dealer delivers my oil. He or she is now going to be in statute, have to move toward more re renewable. And they can do that by changing the makeup of the fuel itself. As we heard, they could yes. you know start to make fuel that's less increase the blend. Increase yep. the blend. They can do it by I don't know in my mind how they do it through the heat pump piece. I mean I have heat pumps, but how would they then you know how does that work? Be I mean besides the, the blend is seems to me like the easiest. Okay, it's sort of in their control, but how do they use the other pieces? Um so when a heat pump is sold, it necessitates less carbon fuel right. to be sold to that same person. 
Um, there are um, other states who have done research on how you calculate that differential. Okay. And so it's based on the idea that someone who has a heat pump is not going to need to purchase as much carbon as test fuel. Right. Same with weatherization. Right. Again, it's creating the difference. Right. But that sounds like it's on the consumer. I don't know how, so how does all of a sudden what the consumer might be doing, it sounds as though it's benefiting the fuel dealer, which is fine. But I thought it was we, we were putting a lot of pressure on the fuel dealer to do these kind of work. Kind of work. Um, so the fuel dealers are the ones who have the obligation. Okay. Um, they have four, te technically four options on how they get to that obligation. Yep. So they, if they don't want to do any sort of installation work yep. for themselves, which they could, they, they could take that on. They okay. could start working with a contractor to purchase their credits, or, yeah. work, or they could go to the default agent or just participate in the open market. But if all of a sudden Brian Campion puts in a bunch of heat pumps, how does it sounds like that also benefits the fuel dealer? They can somehow say, hey, Campion put in these heat pumps, he's using less fuel. How does that connect? How does my decision connect with the fuel dealers? So potentially they will um, want to either purchase your credits that yeah. could make you some money, right? Um, or they could be building that price differential into because they're going to be um, complying with the obligation. There is incentives that hopefully they will be passing up to their customers. Okay. Okay. Thank so, you. Yeah. Senator Weston, that's on the call. So yesterday when they were talking about setting the pricing for the credits, mm -hmm. I think what I heard them say was California already does that. That's a big, huge job. Mm -hmm. Should we not just, if we do this, just say we're going to follow California like we've done with auto emissions and have them set that or or but under this bill it has the department setting um the the carbon piece so that's one really quite big decision point i would think so currently this bill is proposing very specifically to work on fossil heating fuel only California isn't, or their credits are not for heating fuel. They're for transportation fuels. Okay. Um, and the same with Oregon. Oregon is working towards heating fuels and they are potentially going to establish a system, but currently no one is doing this exact model for heating fuels. Okay. This model is very similar to what Oregon, Washington, and California have done with their transportation fuels. And is that because I mean we're unique in our use of fossil fuels for heating, and they have bigger transportation loads are a bigger portion of their total emissions portfolio. I think that's they're still our biggest too. So okay, very helpful. That's very helpful. Senator McCormick. Thank you. Very helpful. This is not a rhetorical question. Is, is it does it really have to be this complicated yeah is there no simpler way to do this the simple way is to just charge everybody a buck extra per gallon and spread the money around yeah you're right and did the house consider simpler alternatives and reject them did the house committee think some something like that that one well, we can't do that because and then we end up having to have this because i gotta say i mean uh, it's my job to know to understand this. I have put in time on the job time learning this, and I don't understand it. And meanwhile, I have to explain this in 10 minutes at legislative breakfast to citizens who are not stupid and they're not mean, but they're loaded for bear right now. <laughs> I don't want to explain it. That's, why, so we that's what we're trying to understand it. <laughs> but, 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 so what did you say? Bring Ellen with you. Some of that in my senses. This must be a simple way of doing this. You, know, you charge more for the fuel. Just so, charge more for the fuel and let that people. That might not be fair to you, Ellen. If, 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 I, I have a short answer. Okay. The short answer is the Vermont Climate Council, in their report, specifically recommended this method. And House Energy took it up and spent. Mm -hmm. 
two months working on this language. The bill that they started with was 10, 12 pages. The draft that I wrote for Senator Bray that's been introduced in this body has is only eight pages. Um, there are there is a simpler way to draft this um, because what uh, I'll just there are simpler ways to draft this. However, what that requires is giving more authority to the agency and more discretion and saying, here's a really short version, come up with a plan for us, oh. fill in the details. Let us know how it's going, we can weigh in. This, well, we've kind of done that already with the council, right? That's what we do with the climate council. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there, do our job. There was a working group that spent quite a bit of time on this. Um, and so this is a there's a 70 page white paper on this model. Um, I think in previous sessions, this bot this body and the house considered very simple carbon taxes, um, raising the fuel tax. I think there have been other simple models. Um, this is the one that was proposed in the house. They added significantly more detail than as it was introduced because they like with the low income customer. They found a need that they want specific protections for low income customers. So they started with, I started by drafting a simple model as based on the white paper. And then we filled in details where the house had specific concerns because really you are delegating authority to a, a body to do a lot of this work. Um, so I mean, we're, de we're delegating a lot of stuff anyways. To them. I mean, just the list of what the carbon stuff is. I, I'm going to be interested to see what the timeline is, because just to do that, if they're having to invent one because nobody else is doing it, mm -hmm. it would seem like that that alone is going to take time. So. I mean, and also I, I'm not going to be snarky, but I only got through one page so far. He still has one, you know. I'm so, say for, no, it's, that's on us, not you. Right. And so I just, and that know, was helpful, that discussion. And I think that discussion was important because there's a couple things there. This further in the language, uh, there is a section on which modeling the PUC should use because there has already been modeling done by uh, respected organizations on carbon intensity. So there are provisions in here. I think the house, you know, they can spend some time on this. And there were people even before the house that spent months on this. So I, I'm, happy, I'm happy to work with you all to hopefully make it clear if you are looking to do that, but. Right, and I think, you know, um, this committee has had a real concern about basically rulemaking, which is the, I mean, we're, we're going over for a docket and stuff like that, but in essence, it's the same sort of deal. And I think over time, we've learned that if we aren't really, if we're not explicit enough, we can get a program back that it's not what doesn't really meet our legislative intent. I don't want to go into the whole thing on that metering and you're unsatisfied. No, 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 but, but, but no. So that one is like the chastening experience. So I think that's part of why the amount of detail keeps yeah. getting rolled in. So yeah, they have a job, but we keep putting up guardrails for them. And so on, like on your, your note there, we're, we had TJ4 in here, and he says there are winners and losers. And we said, as the expert, as the pilot that understands this harbor, where are the winners and losers, and what's the order? And he goes, I don't have a list. Well, if we don't have a list to start with, I believe our job is to take the winners and losers we have today and the order in which they are listed and have them form a different order to be a yeah. different order of winners and losers. And if you, because we're gonna, somebody's gonna write the rules to reprioritize and make a different list. Yeah. And if the department, and I, I'm, being cruel to the department can't tell us what the existing order is what's the order what's how would we make the changes to get a different order um you want whale oil at the top of the list you know, you know, have whale oil farms and it'll be they won't be uh, they'll be clean and that's what you want if you can get them right well yeah but, your point's well taken out you know from like because these provisions we're adding in respond to an implicit 
list of winners and losers, right? So if we're not explicit about it, then it's hard to have the right guardrails. And Coda might have some answers on, you know, well, he had a pentafall, what the, the winners and losers, and then as a lobbyist, he might have a, what he would like to see the new list to be that would be different from someone else. I think his list started with like Hydro Quebec, GMP, Mitsubishi, people selling in the electricity and the equipment that would use electricity to create thermal heat. All right, well, so you are actually already with our first witness of next week to, to continue to walk through. This was like a bonus time that we were able to find. So I'm um, acknowledging Wednesday. now we're not going to finish. Wednesday. Wednesday is like, that's perfect. Any chance we'll get a Monday or two on this before we have to deliver? Ooh, a Monday. Well, I'm sorry, what was that question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just didn't hear it. Monday, Monday. Oh, okay. HXs are getting Oh, yeah. We, we're being asked to yeah, I'm fine. do this intelligently. As long as we do. Um, but it's a multi step process. Okay, so. Well, so that's a great question. Uh, and we are getting to crunch time. Are people available to come in on Monday, like a three hour? Not time? in, but I or could Zoom for an hour. Probably. Okay. And if we I, do something, what time for day on Monday? No. If I, the only thing I would say to you yeah. is over the next two to three weeks, yeah, I expect um, appropriations will start yeah. meeting on that. And what time do you guys usually? I, 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 I have will have no idea about any of that. But I would say in the um as we. Did our first language sections yeah. in the back of the bill? We, I, as we get the push, I think there'll be a push for us to start meeting on Monday. I just, yeah, sure, and that will uh, understand it. And it, uh, the money committee is taking questions, so that's part of the deal. I suspect finance. I suspect you guys will as well. But I don't. I haven't heard a peep about this Monday. I think we may be a little ahead of the curve. So if we're talking about this coming Monday, what is what is Monday? Can we find a block of three hours? No way can I do three hours. I just my Mondays are packed, you know. We all, I work also and others do as well, but uh at three hours I could do a little bit, but right. no way. Well, I so can we, monkey with my Monday schedule for for Zoom participation. For Zoom. Okay. So you would be Zoom and Zoom. I don't um, think we'd all be Zoom. Okay, I, mean, I I probably actually I usually come over money, but depending on the time, I might be zooming too. So so are you feeling this is a necessity at this point that we're that far behind? Yeah. The, okay. The schedule that has us getting through most of everything we've yeah. gotten has us voting this out a week from today. Okay. Okay. Oh, I can't. I'm going to be having trouble even understanding. Well, I know that we might roll okay. over a day or two, but okay, it's a week from today that, and then other things okay. we'll have to adjust. This, we're the, definitely an up tempo. The conversation we just had the first time. I'm beginning to get this. Yeah, that was I very know. helpful. This is this is big. I didn't yeah. mean to in any way suggest it is. That this is a this is a big, big bill and it is complicated. Yeah. But that back and forth was extremely helpful. Yeah. I mean, now I can, you know, get my head around what we're really trying to do here. And okay. it raises some questions that. Right. So, how about if we aim for two hours on Monday? And would it be what? I know people have obligations. So, you may not, and I don't know if you're available as well. On Monday. So <laughs> we all have schedules. So, yes. but I think two hours uninterrupted, like we're not. Going to have anything else going on would be helpful. In a perfect world, I'd prefer early yeah. day to get on with the day one. I am busy from 10 to 11 on Monday. 8 to 10? Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> there well, goes. would people want to jump on early, like okay. 8? Well, I don't know what she just said. She's busy. I can, I, can, I, can, I can get on at 8. That would be, yes, I could do that. Well, I thought you said you were busy from 10 to 11. You didn't yeah. hear her response when we said, and we proposed how about I think I her exact like, words, and I quote. Monday at 8 a.m. <laughs> I can manage. I'll be fine. Okay. Eight? I'm good with eight. 
Senator Westman, I'm looking, I mean, you and I are the, the work, I think everyone else is retired. We are. We will cater to. Thank you. You too. Yeah. Thank you. Gentlemen. Yeah. I, so I, our mornings, because later in the day is really better for me. I, I can do, I mean, I like one end or the other, to be honest. Yep. That's it, my, that, my well, thing. Three o'clock. I'm good for three o'clock. I'm okay here. And I can actually be here at three o'clock. So how about we do three to five? Senator Westman, is that that would be better? Okay, now is this a real meeting and agenda item? Mm -hmm. Or is it an informal? Yeah. It'll be I think we're gonna be going through the bill. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's an agenda. Okay. Well, so I have to wear a necktie. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't no. think you do. Not for a committee meeting, I don't think. Uh, I don't, I don't wear a jacket. But all right. All right. All right. So we'll do that. Everyone's good there. Thank you for your flexibility. Thanks for the suggestion, Senator McDonald. I think it's a good idea to just have a uninterrupted block so we can finish walking and have all the discussions because that was a really helpful thing. So can I ask one more Explain follow up? Yes. Just in terms of scheduling. Are, are you working for the a May 6th? Adjournment is that um, if that's what I'm you know it's just helpful for that's me. The yeah, that's the date. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, that helps me also yeah, yeah. my adjournment of this committee or in general? No, permanently. So this committee closes, that means in three weeks. Okay. Yeah, three so weeks. So just so right. everyone okay. having worked on the calendar, here's how uh, I'll just go through the bills uh, in the order of the um the the calendar. This would be out a week from today. Okay. Four eight. Also out by four eight, and I think this one's uh, will be easy to do. Um, four six six for water bill mm -hmm. includes the a modification to address the situation for farmers. Um, One seventy five the bottle bill out a week two weeks from today. Great. Um, six oh six, which is the thirty by thirty land bill. We begin on the eleventh. And we are out by the 22nd on that. 697, which is East Valley Appraisal, begin on the 11th, out by the 22nd. 518, the Municipal Energy Bill, um, begin on the 20th, out by the 29th. Then in the first week of May, when we can catch like 8 to 9 a.m., just one hour blocks, there are maybe, maybe, but usually we're allowed. No, I know. I'm thinking of other committee also. We're all going to be scrambling for that block. Yeah. Yeah, but you have all afternoon. Uh, no, we wish we would. <laughs> the floor is not going to allow us to be committee all afternoon. Yeah, well, you're an afternoon committee. So we'll be short at any rate. So if the, the bills are quite contained, 411, want waste. Um, 482, sorry, I don't have all the names right now. Petroleum cleanup fund is a, like a technical tweak. 523. Hydrofluorocarbons, uh, Kurtz bill, uh, another technical tweak, 500, the mercury lamps, another technical tweak. So these to me seem like bills that we can. Oh, uh, I didn't hear the word Act 250 in there. <laughs> 234 is already gone. Uh, 492 is on the list, but it's not currently. Uh, we're we're filling in our brackets yeah, here, and, the, exactly and we, we don't know who's going to exactly when four hundred two fits yeah. into that schedule. It's still up for discussion. So that's uh, that's the, the current. That's the, that's based on May sixth squeeze play. I hope we get another. I hope it is a week later. Yeah. Aiming for one, yeah. realizing that we need another week. And that'll take a little pressure off, so we want to much more time. Than that. Chairman, has there been any talk in the, the chair's meetings or from the leadership? In other years, there have been times when the morning committees were shut down before. Yeah. That's right. Well, yeah. Are we going to be well, shut down at some point? Uh, well, they just announced the date. We, they canceled chairs. I haven't had a chance to hear from the pro tem about how far they're thinking of backing off morning. Meetings. Yeah. You know, we can get a rules. I think we have to go to 
rules to meet. Is that accurate? I know we got our hands slapped one year because we kept meeting my first year, but I think we just have to go to rule or not rules, consent rules that says, Last yeah. Year we just asked for yeah, something. Yeah. We have to do something to make sure we can it. So, uh, yeah, well, and why are we in this predicament? Because in the house has been busy. Planning meetings in November, December, January anticipated us receiving an order of four to six bills, and we got 14. So it's a bumper crop. Good news for the environment. And dealing with the bumper crop is just a, a yeah. challenge. All right, so we have another 10 minutes now. And um, you want to continue on the page we are, and maybe it precipitates another discussion, and that's fine too. Sure. So at the bottom of page eight, subsection E, we have we have already discussed this. So credit banking, yeah. the, com the commission shall allow an obligated party that has met its annual requirement in a given year to retain clean heat credits in excess of the amount for future sale or application to the party's obligated, uh, the obligated party's annual requirements and future compliance periods. On to page nine, default delivery agent. I've already mentioned this, but here's the, the full description of this. So an obligated party may meet its annual obligation through a designated default delivery agent appointed by the PUC. The default delivery agent shall deliver creditable clean heat measures to Vermont homes and businesses when an obligated party chooses to assign its annual requirement to the default delivery agent, or an obligated party, party fails to produce or acquire their required amounts of clean heat credits. So an obligated party can choose to assign their credit need to the default delivery agent, and they will get those credits from them because the default delivery agent will go do work that generates credit. They will probably have to pay for that. Okay. Or when an obligated, and we're going to get to enforcement next, but when an obligated par party fails to meet their requirements, they will be charged a penalty. That penalty will go to fund work by the op by the default delivery agent. Say it again, please. Uh, when they fail to meet their their required amount every year, there will be enforcement, and one of the um, options is for the penalties from enforcement to go to the default delivery agent, who will then use that money to do clean heat work. It sounds it sounds like it's functioning like an alternative compliance payment. Yes. For that. It sounds yes. like something that's needed in the bottle pickup bill. Okay. The commission shall designate the default delivery agent. The default delivery agent shall be a single statewide entity capable of providing a variety of clean heat measures and hired for a multi-year period through a competitive procurement process. The entity selected as the default delivery agent may also be a market participant. All right, so this means it's gotta be a statewide agency uh, entity and they have to do a variety of clean heat things. So they probably should have a, 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 a business, and they're a market participant. So they're a business who does either weatherization work and or installs clean heat pumps. They can't be a, an entity that only does one thing. So is this the, uh, based around the notion of maintaining customer choice or, yes. or, or not picking winners and losers? Or yeah. hiring efficiency for work. It's describing something that already exists and ruling out things that haven't been invented yet. Okay. By order or rule, the commission shall adopt annually the cost per clean heat credit to be paid to the default delivery agent by an obligated party that chooses this option. In making adjustments to the, the credit cost, the commission shall consider the default delivery agent's anticipated cost to deliver clean heat measures and costs borne by customers, among other factors determined by the commission. Change to the cost of the credit shall take place not less than 180 days after adoption. So this is going to act like a cap on the number of credits because these credits in theory should be the most expensive because the PUC is going to set the amount. And it should be the last resort um, for a supplier to, to purchase credits from. So the 
the default organization has a monopoly when others fail? The I, I don't know. I uh, when when who fails? Well, the default is is the one that gets the business when the other entities that have tried to provide cleaner heat fail to provide cleaner heat or make contracts that they yes. that don't see that are broken for whatever reason. Yes. So this the default is a kind of has a monopoly on the failure is, yes. is benefits from the failures of others. Um, I don't know if it's that it's providing a, it's providing a standing provider who will always be accessible to the parties to do the clean heat work. Mm -hmm. So there's always an option that will exist if they can't find a contractor or if they can't find credits, there will always be an entity that exists that they can go to. It is a monopoly because it is a, a single one. However, before that happens, they're supposed to um, use their other options. Mm -hmm. Or if they feel like it's too much work for them to do the other options, it does provide a very simple, direct option for them to just say, all right, I want my credits. Here's what the cost per credit is for you. You take the money and do the work. So you could subcontracting it? Is that a sub being subcontracted? It's, it's structured here as the payment for credit work to be done. I don't know if it would be considered subcontracting, but. It... Well, it's McDonald Campion organization again, saying we will, we will weatherize and we'll, we'll succeed. And then we, you know, we're, we somehow become credible according to the bill. And then we go out and hire other people to, um, to do the work on our behalf. And, and that's okay. Yes. As long as and if, and if we turn out to be, uh, to be, um, you know, Maybe. pardon, unreliable. <laughs> I was trying to use a word that I wouldn't mind using for myself, but I wouldn't use for someone else. Sure. Sure. Oh, come on, a dirty rat. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and 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 then you know, kind of take the money and and, and, and right. not, not be in good faith. Um, then it would go to this uh, this default entity. Yes. Okay. Um, and then and later there is provision for the Department of Public Service to be doing the auditing and verification work. Um, it is going to take a lot to stand up a credit system, much like with the RECs. It took a while to make sure that you could establish clearly the the contract and the the line of um, who did the work, did they do the work, did it actually achieve the savings? So that does need to happen. So we're at the top, top of page 10, right? Yeah, can I just read this sentence? I'll because I already said it. But yeah. All funds received from non-compliance payments shall be used by the default delivery agent to provide clean heat measures to low income customers. So that's the other aspect of that. So the penalties are going to are specifically earmarked for low income customer work. That's a perfect place to stop and there's enforcement next and that we can I ask the questions about it. May I bring in one analogy for sure? Sure. And just if, if we wrestled a decade ago with um uh, electricity generation as being a as necessary um etc. And I saw New England was in charge of that. And I saw New England would give cash rewards to the generators of electricity that came online. Mm -hmm. And those were the rules. And um, in Vermont, we came up with an alternative that did not cover the rules. We had this notion that if you um, put in new pumps and new this and better air conditioners, that we could create electricity through savings. And ISO New England rejected that stuff. And we had to go down and fight and petition and say, damn it, um, our energy efficiency charge is, is the equivalent of generating new electricity because when it works, um, we avoid the need for new electricity. Um, this thing we're looking at has potential for similar 
things to take place. And I say, well, well, is a silly example. But if someone comes up with those things, is there a way to accommodate them? Or is this a locked in thing? Or do we agree that it's locked in and report to our colleagues that, and someone may come up with X, Y, or Z, similar to the way efficiency Vermont did for electricity decades ago. So that was my, we need to be thinking about that as we look at this stuff. So in, there is a section at the end that addresses that. There is a, there is a list, it's an include, the list includes the following things, and those are examples of things. However, there's a process in here for the TAG, the technical advisory group, to evaluate new technology and um, have it reviewed by the TAG to assess it, what its credit value could be and so that can be creditable. And there are always those groups and they're picked for their uh, thoughtful conservative status quo. And they- um, Happy to look at the list. Yeah, you yeah. so list that's, yeah. yeah. Um, and they, they resist until suddenly it's their idea. So that's just one more campaign and then Perfect. I'd like to go to Mr. Chapman because we sure. only have them for about 20 years. And I don't know if I really need an answer to it, but it's just interesting to me back to, as we talk about consumer putting, fining or putting the responsibility on those that are producing the problem. It is interesting that we're with the, putting this on the fuel dealers. I mean, we're not putting it on the people that are, you know, again, really produce the, the fuel, fuel dealers are delivering it. I mean, but, and I wonder if, if there was any conversation in the house at, around, can you get to the, to those that are actually producing, you know, the oil companies, the oil uh, companies. you know, we're, we're putting it on the middle man. We're putting it on the middle man. And we're not yeah. putting it. So. Yeah, no, and it's just, it's just something that continues to strike me. And, and I get it. We might not be able to put it on, on the producer, but we're putting, we are putting it on the middle, middle man. And that might just make the most sense for all of this. Um, and so that was considered. Okay. Um, or at least there was consideration of one step back further, which would be the wholesaler. Okay. Um, producer is one step back even further, and that's, it, I, could we draft that potentially? Will that be practically difficult since one of the producers is the country of Saudi Arabia? Mm. Maybe. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. Very well, interesting. And since thank we're hard, or I think, We've pulled our scope in to the place where we have the legal ability to influence, even though we know that you know we love it. Sam and so mobile uh, that have that have an extended user responsibility. Can, it's, it's can I also add, it, it's also shifting it away from the burden on the direct consumer because changing individual customers' habits yeah. is difficult. Yeah. People need to keep their homes. Sure. So the obligation is not directly on them. So it's on the people well, providing the That's sources. partly my question yeah. in the beginning. But, um, I, I, I'll use for an example, I'll go home and um, I keep saying to Joan, we got to get rid of this oil furnace. I yeah. like it the way it is. Right. Sure. And I am sure. like, that this doesn't make any economic sense yeah. anymore. And that, but to get her to move, it's like, maybe she should come and testify before this committee. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't tell her I said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When we talk about uh, kitchen table, a kitchen table, a kitchen table, yeah. kitchen table, that's what the problem is. It's us. Mm -hmm. And we can't go in, into each kitchen table and, and you know, tie them to the chair and, and beat them until right. they agree. So well, I don't know. You could ask them that. Well, it, but so you you look for places where you you know it's like Gibraltar is a place where you can everybody has to go through there, and that's what the fuel dealers are. They're not yeah they're not evil guys. They're no. the ones that are in a place where no. this the commerce passes through them, and you can collect your fines from the people with kitchen tables at that place. And um, we have to distinguish between their, 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 that's because they're convenient. And use kitchen tables as the segue. 
because the other thing that happens at kitchen tables is people drink beverages. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where's the Gibraltar on this one? Uh, yeah. So, we are thank, you, Mr. Chair. thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Kalski. Um, so, we, uh, as, as Mr. Cameron all knows, we're in the throes of the bottle bill. We talked about, well, Senator McDonald said, why don't we know what's going on in Maine? If that's the closest analog to what we're talking about in this discussion. And thankfully, you've done some investigating, and we'd love to learn what you have found. Sure. So, for the record, Matt Chapman, I'm the director of the Waste Management and Prevention Division with the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, what I did was I put together a table of sort of many of the core aspects of the bottle bill and did a comparison between Maine and Vermont on those aspects. Um, this does not look at H 175 and any distinctions between Maine and what the, the committee is looking at as a proposal. So this is the current Vermont state. Um, so Maine, uh, so first of all, I think the, you know, the deposit with Maine is functionally equivalent to what Vermont does. They have a five cent deposit on most of the containers. They have a 15 cent deposit on liquor and wine. The difference of course is Vermont's scope is smaller currently, right? We don't cover, uh, Maine covers everything. Um, except dairy and unprocessed cider. Ours is limited to beer, carbonated beverages, and wine coolers of liquor. Um, so this is a distinction that, frankly, we weren't aware of until the conversation we have with Maine. Maine's handling fee is higher than Vermont's. Um, it's what? It is higher than Vermont's. So uh, Maine's handling fee is four and a half cents per container, and they do not draw a distinction between commingled and uncommingled containers. Vermont is three and a half cents for commingled and four cents for non-commingled. So that is a distinction between Maine and Vermont. Another distinction between Maine and Vermont is how these sheets are taken, the unclaimed deposits are dealt with. In Maine, if you are not in a commingling agreement, then you're required to provide the state with your un, your your sheets, your unclaimed deposits. If you are in a commingling agreement, you get to keep your unclaimed deposits. So I guess that's the incentive in Maine for being in a commingling agreement. Um, let's see the uh, the administration in Maine. I think it's worth pausing for the second here. Maine, when they first expanded their bottle bill, had seven employees. They currently, due to various reasons, are down to two. They think they need five to effectively administer their program. So right now we have two tenths of one person who works on the bottom bill. So Maine feels that it's been its administration is being shorthanded or understaffed. I think Maine sees that there's the need for additional work to have a field presence. I think the challenge when you deal with unfranchised beverages or beverages that are not in a franchise distribution network is that you need to have a more increased field presence to inspect retail locations to make sure there's compliance. And we heard that at Beverage Baron. Uh -huh. That their people it just didn't do it. More than two tenths or something. Well, I, we would. I, I mean, I'll just to, to stop right there. I don't think we can do it. Yep. I mean, I just don't think we will be able to do any inspection or compliance work associated with the bottle bill with the resources that are currently dedicated to it. Okay. Um, well, you know, when the, when the sheets were recaptured, the, the request of this committee was to put the money into the waste system, but. At that moment, we are short of money, and uh, the most pressing the way to get out of here today was to put that money into clean water. What else we got? Uh, thank you. Did the um, so when you're talking about employees, is it mostly employees who are out? sort of healthy i'm just trying to get sense. I, I think so i mean the conversation we had i think there's some so basically in the bottom bill there's there's sort of several functions right yeah. that we do one is we register the products right mm -hmm. so when somebody comes out with a cherry flavored version of their soda right they yeah. could register that with the state and and that's out there um 
the so that's one aspect of our work. The other, is, and it becomes I think more important uh, when you expand it. You need to make sure that people are actually putting you know the labeling and are appropriately uh, doing the positive initiations with respect to the beverages, right? And then there's I think a set of compliance that exists on the back end with respect to making sure that. Um, well, first of all, that retailers and redemption centers are doing what they're supposed to be doing, collecting all the cans from people who want to drink the cans, that the, the pickup agents are doing what they're supposed to be doing, picking up things in a timely manner so that things aren't accumulating in redemption centers or retailers without, you know, basically taking up space and causing problems within there. And, and I'll be honest, it's been very difficult for the agency to play an active role with no staffing available to do that. Okay. So... Um, just you, you have you main has a distinction. If you commingle, you get treated one way, and if you don't commingle, you get to keep something. What percentage of the take is being kept? So, it's I we I have been told, generally speaking, that the, the dollar amounts equate very similarly between the handling fee and the, the, the deposit, the way Maine treats the deposit from a gross numeric perspective. I don't have exact numbers um, as far as, I guess I would say, um, I am um, very, I think that it would be a challenge to take the approach that Maine has taken with the cheats. Um, with all respect, I think that if you aren't in a commingling agreement, your knowledge of how many deposits have not been collected is not particularly good, and the ability to track that information is not particularly good. So I'm not sure that Maine necessarily feels like they're getting an accurate depiction of how many unclaimed deposits which should be remitted back to the state. So my question, Mr. Chair, was if if we were to change the the where the sheets go, then we got to deal with water money to the lake. If we went increase the amount collected to be equal to mains, how much of that problem with the uh, what the lake might lose or whatever? How how much of a problem would that be? And we that would be helpful. So we before we began to as we deliberate. So that's the end of my question. Okay, I should have asked it more directly. To you. May I clear? So you're wondering how much would be. We're, we're taking away from lake dollars if we move in a certain direction. Is that the question? I think that what Senator McDonald was asking was uh, how much additional unclaimed deposit revenue might we expect from an, in, oh. an expansion of the bottle bill and how oh. we, the committee might be able to make choices. On Got it. That Thank you. That. Thank you. Well, is that accurate, Senator? Yes. Okay. And it, Thank you. Thank you oh. for simplifying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the, the next sort of element is, is funding for administration and, and basically Maine has that I can go through it in detail, but it's there. They have a, a registration fee process that the beverage manufacturers pay to the agency to fund the, the administration of the program in addition to everything else. So that that is how Maine's program ends up being funded. So does that mean I look at forty nine thousand and five in the box below and multiply times four bucks? Yep, and that creates an operating budget. Okay, thanks. That is that is a, a portion of the funding that goes to the main program. Yes, and so again, I think that's the next thing, and I think it's important for the committee to sort of appreciate the scale of the increase. Right, it goes from uh, it would go from sixteen, roughly speaking, sixteen thousand beverage containers registered to close to. Yeah, 49,000 beverage containers registered with an expansion. Um, the, so I think the, the, the way for the program gets implemented from a redemption standpoint is materially the same as far as handling fees going to. There, there's a, a different sort of member dealer agreement process that exists in Maine that's very unique to Maine that we don't think has a significant impact on how redemption centers get funded based on our conversation. It's a little complicated. Um, you can see the distinction in redemption rates between Vermont and Maine. I, I asterisk that, that the dates are not the same and we did see a significant drop in redemption during COVID. So 
one of them's pre-COVID, one of them is during COVID. Um, and then lastly, the number of swords. So right now we have somewhere in the range between 100 and 125 swords. Based on our conversation with Maine, they have six commingling agreements as opposed to one. Within those six commingling agreements, they've told us they're between 160 and 180 swords. And then if you add in all of the people who are not in commingling agreements, there's somewhere between 300 and 400 swords. 160 to 80 versus 300 to 400. Well, so, so again, this is driving the distinction between that is what they believe is that those are the numbers are within the commingled agreements themselves, right? So within those six, there are that many. And then you have a, a, a what is likely a smaller number of fans, a small number of stragglers, but you have to sort them out into the these particular. Thank you. Can you just define a commingling agreement so sure. I understand what what's what's being agreed upon and what's what's happening? So basically, it's a, an agreement amongst beverage distributors to not require sort of counting by brand, but counting by material type. And then they come up with a contractual agreement to deal with it sort of on the back end of things and uh, deal with costs and so forth amongst themselves. So instead of having, um, it, it just pick your favorite, your, your seltzer yeah. can, that would go into one particular right. bin, right? Like in a commingle, that might go in with, Senator, well, another different beverage type or paper. Uh, probably not paper, because okay. it's both, okay. but 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 you know, or whatever. It, plastic. Right. Normally they would go like plastic would go with plastic, okay. aluminum yeah. would go with aluminum, and glass would go with glass. Right. They they often sort container sizes right. the same. Right. Like even within commingling agreements, which is why you see a large number uh, uh, within. I mean, I think- Who do they want though? What is what is it? They're going into this agreement with the hope of what coming out. Well, so I think it, it's it's a cost savings for them and for the, the, the redemption centers, okay. right? So the redemption centers have fewer numbers of sure. swords. Right. And they have, um, frankly, it's an easier from an administrative perspective on their end to manage things that way than to deal with it through separating it out into a single batch, right? And I think that commingling agreements work very well when there are closed distribution systems where like Coke distributes Coke, right? As opposed to distribution systems where a beverage manufacturer sells to Walmart and Walmart's distribution net hub is in Albany and Albany takes it to Northern Massachusetts, Vermont and Northern New York, right? It becomes very difficult for Polar then to figure out how many cans they sold in Vermont. Right. Without, right. Yeah, especially when you're dealing with multiple distribution networks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Chair, well, I just I, I'd like to get this full mingle thing down a little more so we can. Uh, you always like to make questions. Oh, go ahead. If they work, if the bottlers and the distributors work things out together amongst themselves, it takes it away from the from the local store by store by store. They are rewarded with a higher um, uh, handling fee. Is that basically what happens? I think it's the other way around. So if, way around. If, if if beverage distributors can figure out how to lower the number of sorts and thereby lower the cost to a redemption center and the amount of space and work that they need to do. Then they pay three and a half cents as opposed to four cents. Which they right. So if I don't, okay. if I choose not to participate in a commingling agreement as a beverage manufacturer, I have to pay a higher handling fee to okay. I'm the customer something I won't get back. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So in that last spot, so the 160 to 180 swords, that's even with having six commingle groups. But if you really are trying to imagine being a redemption center in Maine, the number is three to four hundred, right? Because you, yeah, you got you have 160 people in in the commingling, uh, but you've still got all these other oddball brands, and you still have to address them all. That's my understanding based on our conversations with Maine. Okay. 
So what do you mean, Mr. Chairman, I address them all? Like, I mean, you got to re receive them. And remember how he said he showed us a box at Beverage, oh, sorry, at Beverage Baron, he showed us a box. Yeah. It had six cans in it from yeah. a brand yeah. like no one had ever heard of, almost. And, yeah. and he has to keep, because they're doing their own redemption, he has to keep waiting till he can fill up that little tiny box mm -hmm. to redeem just those. And so, yeah, similar in Okay. And they had like a total, I think, of somewhere in the neighborhood of like 120 boxes, but I forget the percentage, something like 80 or 90 percent were just going in 13 bins in total. Yeah. Up front. The worst thing about those is the space they take. So, okay. Right. So I just want to make sure you, right, take, you, you yeah. have six really hands sitting here. No, yeah. the challenge. Right. It is. Three to four hundred sorts. That is my understanding. Yeah, yeah. based right. on our conversations. All right. Um, all right. So, well, we have we don't have too much time, but we've been, you know, I wanted to go back. Now that we're back in the building, there's the whole model of you ask interested parties to get together and have a conversation about how to address things in the cafeteria, whether anyone makes it to the cafeteria or not. Who knows? So I put up on the whiteboard a list of parties that I think if we were to do it that way, say, please talk amongst yourselves and come back to things. So Mr. Chapman, you're first, so you're a state expert, yeah. right? Bree, Deeply, Chris Rice, um, Claire Buckley, uh, Aaron Seabris, uh, Paul Burns, um, Beeper, and Tom Run. Um, and I just wanted to, so two questions to the committee. One does the idea of having a working group dig into this and start to find a way out of it uh, appeal to the committee? And two, is that the right group? Trying to keep it small, but make sure we're not leaving any essential player out. So I can't be. I think the group is probably too big. I'm guessing that you've got Paul Burns on one side and maybe everybody else on the other. And so I would say that doesn't feel right to me. So I would say you get Paul Burns and one or two reps from the other. That's that's what I'm guessing would, would feel. And that those people can go out and talk to some of the people or, or there needs to be a couple of sort of chief negotiators, I would say, not not have a have, have it like that. Okay. Well, that's my gut. Okay, so. Uh, um, Doesn't feel fair. Yeah, I get it. So it's really, it's like constituencies. Yeah, but I get those are the right constituencies. I just think. Most of them would probably be on the same page as one another, say for Paul. So that's right. I that's, guess that's I don't know how to get out of that in a way. Well, just have them send two people that have them represent their values and their ideas. Right, but there's different industries there. That's what like Claire, for instance, is not synonymous with uh, well, Mr. Chapman, you mean, you know the players better. If we're just skinning up that list, is you see a way to do that? I, I mean, I think so. Ms. Deedley represents sort of the data end of of the beverage industry. I think that that would be helpful, at least from an agency perspective, yeah. having that. Obviously, Paul or uh, Peter from CLF are both you know good people to have on here from from that perspective. Um, I think having Aaron to represent the interests of retailers and redemption centers makes a lot of sense so that they have an input and a, a pathway to communicate. And then Tom is the current pickup agent for everyone right now. So they can have a lot of data as far as what is going on and, and how the system works regionally. Um, I think, I mean, I know that certainly I'm assuming since I am the state, I am more than happy to try and make the state, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the state agency. I'm happy to try and make it as inclusive as we can possibly make it with an idea of trying to schedule around a certain core group of people. Okay, fine. Uh, well, we just want to make sure that someone who has <coughs> vital interest as it's heard. And um, so I was what's the goal student. of this group? Well, uh, tell us what to do. Um, but, but, but damn it, we do this all the time. time. And 
you know, if you had a, an efficiency engineer go in there and listen to what they had to say and come out and say, you want to do all this for the least amount and not have the taxpayer or a blah, 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 this is what you do. Or do you assign a political solution to a group of six people in the cafeteria, which is what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to cut the babies in half if they have to be cut in half. Well, well, I think you know, the very first question of Mr. Chapman was like, what's 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 CEC helping us think about? And it was about creating a cost-efficient, uh, highly functional system, you know, like and without playing picking favorites as to how you do it. Like, cost-efficient for whom? The bottlers have figured out that it's cost-efficient for them to have the least to do with the trash they generate when they sell their goods. They used to collect them, in a, but they unloaded them. That's their goal. And how much are we gonna allow them to unload? It's, and so, and, and in a way that doesn't leave, you know, Loyal County and the hills of Orange County um, full of trash. No man's of land is what I call it. Yeah. That's what we what, what? No man's land. Yeah. And you know, Pennington, back roads. I, you know, I just hearing that today, um, I thought, well, at least you got a redemption center close because if you have to drive 25 miles, you're not going to go. And then I hear they're waiting in 40 minute lines in that's Bennington. Yeah. I, to redeem bottles? Yeah, that's yeah. what he was saying. Can you imagine? Sure. An hour and a half from now. Well, can wait. you get a COVID shot at the same time? <laughs> but yes. <Yeah>. So <laughs> here, here's Dr. the only thing I'd there. say about <laughs> your group. For me, in this whole chain that is going, if we can't figure out a way to get the bottles picked up more, we're in trouble. Right. That was a common component. So, picked so, up. so. If Tom, oh, Tom okay. well, it's okay. it's the Tamra issue. Yeah. yeah. That that really seems like that's a the bottleneck. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you're right. You're right. And your and so and I'm not sure that maybe Matt could have that, but of the people that are listed up there, I don't think they have the expertise. We need Tom in here and to tell us. And is there in, yeah. in Maine? Who picks up in Maine? Tom Are they I in? So I don't know. I don't know that for certain, but I will. Really How did they get them to pick up more? I, I think making more money. We pay it. My understanding is, is that they've reduced the size of the containers that are present in order to fit everything into uh, a redemption center. So instead of having a large container, so you have much smaller containers, or at least a Well, that size. doesn't help but if, you, but, uh, if, if you're going to um, only pick up every three weeks and then, then you go, well, yeah. I'm supposed to pick up every three weeks, but I'll be here. Was there, was there a Connecticut law that? That had a standardized container. There, there are different approaches that different states use on the administration. I mean, one of the things, so I've dug into a number of states and how they approach the bottle bill and looking at this. And I think, you know, um, if you've seen one bottle bill, you've seen one bottle bill, right? Like every state does it approach differently. There is no sort of common approach that states use and it's their administration of the bottle bill. I think that. You know, if you look at testimony the, the committee received, there's, you know, there are principles that you've received on what constitutes a good bottle bill system. Those principles are not materially different than what, like, the beverage distributors have put out there. Um, I, I do think that if, if you're, I would respectfully request that if you're going to send me into the cafeteria, whether it's virtual or real, yeah. is that there's some direction from the yeah. committee as yeah. to that's what right. it is you would yeah. like that for me to come back with. Yeah, some guidelines. So, right, see, the work group seems like a good idea, but what to do exactly what is this hot box? So, well, we're due on the floor, so I think I'll ask members of the committee to 
think about what that charge would be and I'll reach out to people over the, the weekend to try to not lose time, uh, you know, just keep this moving along. But it's, and well, we're going to have that. So if we don't give you a good charge, then it's your 